too. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking this morning, at, we're continuing with that series actually that we started on becoming a team player, talking about how powerful it is when we work together for the cause of Christ. God never intended to do this alone. He gave us the church. He gave us the body. And one of the things that you have to have in order to be a team player is be successful in life is discipline. Discipline is going to be what really, what we really want to do so that we can do what we really, uh, let me put it this way. Discipline is doing what you don't want to do to get what you really want. That's what discipline is. So discipline is doing those things. You really don't want to do those things, but you know you need to do those things so you can get what you want to do the things that you want to do. And just as no individual succeeds without discipline, neither does any team. That's why we need disciplined members of our team here at Line Area. To become the kind of team that we need to be, we must strive to develop discipline. There's several areas that we need to work on. And so this morning we're going to be talking about those areas of discipline that we need to have in our lives in order for us as a church to be the kind of church, to be a team and to reach out to the world around us. First thing we need to have, if we're a disciplined organization, a a disciplined group, is we need to have disciplined thinking. Disciplined thinking. We all know that we can't get very far in life without using our head. Same is the case in the Christian walk. We must think about what we're trying to do for God. It must be part of our daily thought process. We must be doing these things. If you have your Bible, again, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, great verse, you need to have a star beside this verse. This is one maybe you need to put on the mirror here. But he talks about this. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, things that are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatever thing is good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praiseworthiness, Meditate on these things. Or the King James and New King James says, think on these things. What things you think about will change your life. So we need to ask the question, what are the things that we think about during the course of our day? When you have a few moments of silence, what kinds of thoughts do you allow to occupy your mind? What are you thinking about? And when we talk about, when you're talking and you're thinking about somebody else, What do you think? You know, maybe you need to be a good looker. You see, you know, maybe you're, that's what you ought to be. You ought to be a good looker. You see somebody say, man, that's, 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 they're good looking. Well, maybe you need to be good looking. You need to be good looking in the way you think about people. You need to think good about people. You know, we're, we're in a society today that always thinks the worst in everybody, don't we? And I understand that because we see so much evil that goes around the world. But listen, we need to give people the benefit of the doubt sometimes. When somebody says that, I just worked an ambulance on Friday and I was, my partner was there. We were making a run. We had just gotten back from, from uh, I think it was Knoxville. And we, we'd been on a run in Knoxville. We came back in town. We were getting fuel. There was a run just a mile from where we were. So, of course, we were the closest unit. You know, we said, okay, we'll take that run. Well, the, the, uh, another ambulance got on there and says, negative, we got that. Well, my partner was just through the roof. Why, how dare him talk to us like that? And how, you know, do that kind of thing and all that. And I said, whoa, 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 back up. I said, you don't know what he's thinking. Maybe he's thinking, maybe he's closer. He wasn't. But maybe he was doing this. And then finally we got there. I said, oh, I know why he did that. He was, he was a town truck. He was wanting to do that because it was a lift assist, by the way, is all it was. It was somebody that fell and they needed help up. I said, Maybe he was just doing that because he didn't want to be next up in town for the next one. He wanted to get that so the other guy would be next up. Well, sure enough, that's what it was. That's not very positive, but at least I was giving him a doubt of why he was doing it. He wasn't doing that to be ugly at us. He was just trying to maybe be ugly at the other group. I don't know, but he was. but, But the thing is, we need to give people the benefit of the doubt. We need to think good things. We need to think about people. When we think about good things that a person has to offer. And what about with yourself? What do you think of yourself? What is your self-image? A lot of people struggle with that. They, they do things, maybe they've done some things, maybe made some mistakes in their lives, and they get this self-image. Well, I'll never be successful. Maybe they failed before. I'll, I'll never be able to do this. I'll never be able to do that. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, as, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You are what you think. You become what you think of yourself. You will be what you think of yourself, good or bad. 
Sometimes we've been programmed to think that way. You know, if you've been thinking poorly of yourself, maybe because uh, your, your parents or somebody in your family had told you, oh, you're never going to amount to anything, and you started believing that. And so you never amounted to anything. Or, or maybe your boss said something negative to you, or a relative or, or, or said to you something. And all I want to tell you the, to that is stop. Stop listening to those voices. Stop doing that. You are a unique individual. Carefully made by God. Made in his own image. And to think of myself as less than good enough is in a sense thinking that God is not good enough. He was what made me. If I'm not good, then God, what, he failed in making me? I need to change my self-view is what I'm saying. You are a unique individual. You are made for God's glory. God wants you to be there. He wants, he's got plans for you. He says, it, they're good plans for you. You can do anything that you set your mind to do. You can become the person that you want to be. You can become the person that God designed you to be. It's all up to you and how and what you think about yourself. Now, if you keep your mind active... Maybe regularly taking on mental challenges and continue to think about the right things, you'll develop the disciplined thinking that God wants you to have and you'll be able to become what He wants you to be. Again, what did He say in that verse before there? He said, He said, Think on these things. Whatsoever's good, whatever's just, whatever's noble, what's true what's pure, what's lovely, what's a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise. Think on these things. That's what he told us to do. That's how you need to be. Because as you think you are, that's what you are. In Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. He tells us, Train yourself to think positive thoughts and do positive things and you'll be amazed at how much better your life will become because of your disciplined thinking. Be a good looker when you look at other people. Second thing, you need to have disciplined emotions. How do you express our emotions? Ask yourself that. How do we express our emotions most commonly? Well, we do it with our tongue. In James chapter 3, 3 through 5, he says this. Indeed, we put bits in a horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn the whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by the four fierce winds, they are turned by very small rudder wheresoever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Our tongue guides us oftentimes. It will take us places maybe we don't want to go. What happens, you know, you get in there and you get in a conversation, you pop off with something maybe you shouldn't have said. All of a sudden there's a fight. Your tongue, what has it done? He's gotten you in trouble. You need to be careful what you say. We sing that song, be careful little tongue what you say. Be careful little tongue what you say. For the Father's up above and he's looking down below. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. You need to be careful what you say. You need to be careful, disciplined in what you say. Our tongues can guide you in the wrong places. It's what helps others to form their opinions of us by what you say. We have just two choices when it comes to our emotions. We can master our emotions or we can be mastered by our emotions. That's the choice that you have. Doesn't mean in order to be a good team player that, that I must turn off my feelings. But it does mean that you shouldn't let your feelings prevent you from doing what you should or drive you to doing things that you shouldn't do. By being overwhelmed by your emotions, and, and, you know, and, and those emotions would include anger. Those include those things that get you in trouble. You know, I remember hearing the story about Bobby Jones. He was a great golfer. Began playing when he was five years old. He, he began playing at 14. He qualified in the U.S. Amateur Championship. Didn't win because of his problem. He was a club thrower. Any of y'all ever seen one of them? I had a good friend of mine uh, named Joey Haynes. 
he, we worked together when I was in Rome, Georgia. He was the, he was the youth minister there at the time, and, and he became their minister there. And Him and I went and played golf a couple of times. We only played a couple. Now, I want you to know I'm not that good of a golf player. I never have been. I'm not a good golf player at all. As a matter of fact, I keep score a little bit different than everybody else. Uh, you know, if I go in with five balls and I find one in the rough, I'm one over par. If I go out missing three, I was three under par that day, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, so, but, uh, but Joey, man, he took his golf serious. We got out there playing. Man, he'd hit, he'd miss, and he'd go off, or he'd, you know, go off one way or the other. I'd say he'd take that, he'd pitch that thing. I told him one time, I said, I am not playing with you again. I'll never, I, unless you could get your temper under control, I'm not playing with you. I said, I can't believe anybody would play something for entertainment that would make them so angry. If it's going to make you that angry, you need to come up with another sport. But this guy, the same way with Bobby Jones, he, he was one of those, he was, he, would, he was that club thrower. There was an older golfer approached him one time. He said, you'll never win until you can control that temper of yours. Well, he took the advice. He went on to become one of the greatest golfers in history. Retired at 28 after winning the Grand Slam of golf. That same older golfer said, Bobby was 14 when he mastered the game of golf. But he was 21 when he mastered himself. That's when he became a winner. Do your emotions master you? How often do you say things before you think? Do you just pop off with something? How many times have you severed a tie between you and somebody else because of what you might have said that you, you know, at the time, you shouldn't have said? And you look back and you regret what you said. How many of us have done that? You know, someone says, uh, I, I, by the way, I, I get put off with someone says, you know, they'll, they'll pop off with something. They say, oh man, I didn't mean that. Yeah, you did. You know. Out of the heart proceeds the issues of the mouth. Out of the mouth proceed the issues of the heart. And, 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 you know, what you say is what you are. That's what he said. You know, and, and uh, I tell people, you know, what's down, in the, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. But you need to control yourself. Do your emotions master you? How many times have your words reflected someone that maybe is not such a good follower of Jesus? When, when someone hears what you say, their opinion of what a Christian is maybe might not be that good. James chapter 3, 9 through 12 says, With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter with the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. He's talking about the tongue. If we are truly going to be an example for God, we must become different, di differentiated by the words that we use. We need to be different from the world in the way that we're viewed by the world. Let me ask you this. When you're at church and you're singing these songs of praise and you go to work the next morning and you tell that coarse joke, you say those curse words, you, you, you use profanity, you do all these different kinds of things, you, you're, you pop off in anger and say ugly things to people all the time. James says, can blessings and cursings come from the same mouth? We need to be careful. What are your emotions keeping you from becoming? Think about it. What about your emotions? What about your emotions that's keeping you from becoming what you could be? I mean, can your emotions be what keeps you from being an elder? You know, the Bible gives a qualification to elders. It says temperate. means controlled. Of good behavior. Gentle. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
2 and 3, giving the qualifications, giving the, the characteristics of one who takes the office of the eldership. And another one in Titus 1 verse 7, not quick-tempered, not violent, describing a man who's going to serve in the eldership. What I'm saying is, is, is your temperament, is your character, is the way you speak, is the way you control your emotions, keeping you from being that kind of person. I'll never forget when I was a, a young Christian, about 18 years old, in church in Brownsville, Tennessee, and we had a group of elders there, and, uh, you know, they were, they, they were fair, you know, they were good men, but we had some that just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't keep it under control. And I, I remember two incidents that happened, two different elders at that church that really, as a young Christian, just hurt me to the core. I was standing there one day, and there was a younger guy up there talking to an elder. He was complaining to an elder, and, and uh, this elder all of a sudden takes his glasses off and says, let's go to the parking lot. I'm thinking, what? By the way, it says not a brawler either. <laughs> he was going to the parking lot. I'm going to whoop this boy. Then another one, I was out, we were out working in the back, working on something on the church building, and, and uh, again, something didn't go just right and everything, and man, all of a sudden, he had that, he had a handful, he had keys in his hand for some reason, I don't remember why, all of a sudden, he takes and just throws him keys out there. First, my first thought is, that was stupid. My second thought is, seriously, you're an elder. As a young guy, that really bothered me. Do your emotions take control of you? Does that your emotions, is, is that what's keeping you from getting that promotion at work? Is it your emotions that are out of control that keep you from being a better spouse or a better parent? What emotions do you need to master? Or do your, do your, do your emotions master you? What will you become when you do master those emotions? Third thing, you need to have disciplined actions. Not only do you need to have disciplined emotions, not only do you have to have disciplined thinking, you need to be careful how you think. You need to have disciplined actions. Sharpening your mind and controlling your emotions are important, but they can get you only so far. Action is what separates those who will achieve and those who do not. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, he says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. What do you see here? You see deliberate action on Jesus' part. Christ was so close to the Father because he had a relationship with him, and with him a priority in his life. It was disciplined action. Matthew chapter 17, 20 and 21. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You want to know what kind of faith is going to cause you to be able to move a mountain? You know what kind of, by the way, I heard a thing one time where a guy said, you know, Lord, you say faith will move a mountain. Little faith moves a mountain. Lord, I just need enough faith to move me. We need that action. We need to be moved by our faith. But he says, how do you get that faith that, that faith will move a mountain? How do you get a faith that you can say to a mountain, move here and it'll move? He says, by prayer and fasting. How is our faith strengthened according to this passage? Fasting and prayer. Deliberate and disciplined action. That's what he's calling us, folks. The athlete who, doesn't, who, who, who does the extra workout, the student who puts in those extra study sessions, and, and the parent who comes home when he promises instead of working late are all practicing disciplined actions. And when they do, others benefit. What are you doing to become a person of disciplined actions? Develop a routine. Keep your appointments. When you have an opportunity to serve, do it. Actions speak louder than words. So, how are you doing when it comes to discipline? How are you when it comes to discipline? Well, here's your take-home points. To become a more disciplined player, here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to strengthen your work habits. Finish the tasks that you started. 
Don't be the weak link in a family. Don't be the weak link in a church. Don't be the weak, weak link in a work project. You know, there's people that you could ask to do something. You know when you ask them to do something, it's going to get done. Then there's other people that you ask to do something. They say, oh, yeah, man, I'll do it. But you know you're going to have to be there because they're probably not going to show up. Is that you? Maybe you need to change. Work in a way that will enable others to associate you and your work with quality. When they think of you, they think, you know what? I, I've told them I want to get it done. I'm not worried about it anymore. There's some people in this church that are that way. I, you know, I'll ask them to do something. They, and when I, they say I'll do it, I don't even think about it from that point on because I know I don't have to worry about it. There's others I'll ask to do something, and I may have to remind them five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. You see the difference? Then the second thing is take on a challenge. To strengthen yourself, take on a task that will put you in over your head. Do things that are outside your comfort zone. By the way, you know, you that are getting older in here, they say that you'll do things that's outside your comfort or keep your mind fresh. But do things that you're, you might find out you got a talent you don't even know you had. If you'll do something outside your comfort zone, yeah, rather than saying, oh, I, I can't do that because I've never done that before, you might say, you know what, I've never done that before, but I'll try. See the difference? I've always been kind of different in that area there where, you know, I got into emergency services. Mark Fox came to me back, whew, a lot of years ago. Came to me in this church when I first came here. Mark was one of them that got me to come here. Him and, him and uh, Scott Shanks were the two that approached me to come in the line area the first time. They had been to Russia and came and back and said, heard of, we were coming back and called and said, we want you to come here. But I got, went here long. Mark comes to me and he says, are you claustrophobic? Not here, I'm preaching, you know. Are you claustrophobic? I thought, what's it got to do with preaching? But yeah, yeah, no, I'm not claustrophobic. He said, well, good. We need, a, back then I weighed 130 pounds. He said, we need a little guy that we can send into a cave to do cave searches because we got all these big guys in the rescue squad and they can't get in there. Would you, would you help them? We do a lot of searches in Salt Peter Cave. I said, well, okay. And that's when I joined a rescue squad. But from that point on, I'd always do things. Someone would come up and say, well, we need something in this area here. I said, well, if you'll pay for it, I'll take the class. And I'd take a class. I'd take, a, you know, swift water rescue. Uh, well, we need, some, we need somebody to do high angle rescue. Well, if you'll pay for the class, I'll take it. I don't know anything about it. Uh, we need, when, when Katrina hit, the government sent out a thing, we need ham radio operators. Well, if you'll pay for the class, I'll take it. Uh, I was in, and uh, came and uh, they didn't have a rescue squad in Illinois. Well, we, so I said, well, you know, we need a chaplain at our fire department. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, and then they say, well, you know, we need, and, and on and on. We need uh, uh, all these different things. And then finally EMT, we, we were working in, the, in there. And they said, well, well, if you pay for the class, I'll take it. I had no, I, I never had any intention to doing any of those things. But an opportunity came. I got to thinking, you know, I can't do that. I've never done that before. But if you'll pay for it, I'll take it. <laughs> the Lord has paid for it. Take it. Do what he's asked you to do. Step outside your comfort zone and do some things maybe you're not so used to. Take on a challenge. And as you do this, you'll find out you'll be able to accomplish more and more because of how you've challenged yourself. You will grow and you'll be blessed. By the way, it's coming time to start getting teachers for the December, January, February classes. And I'm going to be hitting some of you guys up. I'd like to hear from you. If you'll pay for it, I'll do it. Some of you have never done it before. Step out of your comfort zone. Then finally, tame your tongue. If you tend to overreact, one of the first things you can do in this area to help yourself is to stop yourself and, uh, from saying things that you shouldn't. Just ask yourself, is this really going to help before you spout it off? You say, well, I can't. Really? Sure you can. Maybe you can't. With God you can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How can I do this? Think before you speak. Be careful. You know, during the 14th century, 
Renald III was a duke who is, was in what is now called Belgium. As a result of a violent quarrel, Renald's uh, younger brother Edward successfully revolted against him. When Ed, Edward captured Renault, he built a room around him. And in this room, he featured a window and a door. And he promised him the day that he left his room, the title and the property that he once had would be restored to him. The problem with this arrangement was that Renault was grossly overweight and couldn't fit through the opening in the room. Renald needed to lose weight before he could leave that room. Edward knew that his older brother couldn't control his appetite. So he would send great foods to him every day. And as you can imagine, Renald grew fatter in that room. Anytime he would accuse Duke Edward of treating Renald uh, cruelty, he would say, my brother is not in prison. He can leave the room anytime he wants to. That's what he would tell people. Renald stayed in that room for 10 years. Wasn't released until after Edward died in a battle and they had to disassemble the room to get him out. But then his health was so ruined that he died within a year. He was a prisoner of his own appetite. Now just as Renald was enslaved by his appetite, sin enslaves all those who yield to it. A person lacking discipline is a prisoner without bars. We need disciplined players on this team. Are your habits making a prisoner out of you? Ask yourself that this morning. If we can help you this morning, you believe in Christ, wanting to turn from your sins, confess your faith, uh, you can be baptized into Christ, be added to the church, but you don't just need to be a haphazard member. You need to be a disciplined member. You are saying, I am giving myself, I'm yielding myself to God's control. And he'll make a new you out of you. If we can help you this morning, maybe you need the prayers of the church. Whatever your need might be, I want to encourage you as we stand, we offer the invitation.